Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the June edition of the Forest Connect webinar series. My name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. And I'd like to welcome you. This is our monthly webinar series, which we've had going on now for a very long time. And it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to see uh, familiar faces, familiar names and new names. Um, today, we're going to be joined by Dr. Paul Curtis. Paul is a professor in the Department of Natural Resources and the Environment, the New York State Wildlife Extension Specialist, and somebody who I've worked with on a number of different projects over the years. And Paul's a leader of a effort to assess the impacts of deer on vegetation. Uh, Paul's done a variety of different wildlife damage and uh, wildlife related projects over the years, many more than I could possibly capture here in a few seconds of introduction, but I'm very happy that Paul has joined us. I'm happy that you all have joined us, and I am going to just encourage you to feel free to type in questions as they come to mind. We'll, we have them in the chat box, and we will uh, review those, and Paul will answer those when we get to the end of the presentation, but please type them in as you have them to make sure that we, uh, we have them and we can uh, refer back to those. So Paul, with that, I'm going to mute my microphone, turn it over to you and I uh, look forward to enjoying this presentation. Thanks for joining us. Thanks very much, Peter. I just wanna recognize that this is a very collaborative project. Uh, uh, myself, Christy Sullivan, Peter Smallage and Tracy Testo from uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension have been involved with developing and implementing uh, the AVID protocol. And we've partnered with Jeremy Hurst from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation. And Jeremy has been uh, very so supportive and uh, DEC provided uh, funding for this research and extension effort. What I'd like to do is first of all, talk a little bit about background. Why do we get involved in assessing vegetation impacts from deer? Uh, many of you from New York have seen these data before. For those from other states who just wanna briefly review it. Uh, back in 2009, uh, Peter, myself, Gary Goff and others uh, worked with Nancy, Nancy Connolly from our Human Dimensions Research Unit at Cornell and did a survey, statewide survey of uh, professional foresters in New York State and I asked them to assess stands that they visited during the past year and whether or not regeneration was successful or, or not. And you can see uh, we were in problems back around 2009 to 2010. Uh, about 70% of the stands statewide that Forrester had surveyed that year uh, had marginally successful or completely failed regeneration. And as a follow-up question, uh, we asked uh, folks, what, what's the reason for the regeneration failure? And by far, deer browsing was this uh, most significant impact statewide, but interfering vegetation also caused a lot of problems. And many stands had multiple stressors that were impacting uh, forest regeneration, but deer browsing by far and away was the, seemed to be the driver in many stands. Um, the Nature Conservancy did a follow-up study looking at uh, forest inventory data in 2010, and they, they published a report. And when we look at the uh, Nature Conservancy data, when you look at desirable timber species, uh, greater than half the state has regeneration in, in the poor or fair range, and it's particularly problematic in, in the Hudson Valley region, Long Island, and in the, in the southern Adirondacks. And uh, for Desirable timber species, we're talking things like maple, oak, ash, cherry are uh, valuable hardwood species. And on many stands, we're having difficulty regenerating those across the state. More recently, Miller and McGill looked at forest inventory data and they uh, look at the entire uh, Northeastern United States and, and published reports showing what they call was a regeneration debt. Uh, if you look at the uh, graph or the figure on the left. If you talk about seedlings, number of seedlings per square meter, it doesn't look too bad. There's some uh, greens and yellows across much of New York State, 
Uh, but the real problem is when you look at the right hand side and look at saplings per square meter, uh, almost half the state is in, in a very poor situation for sapling regeneration. So it seems that we've got seedlings at ground level, uh, but because of deer vivory, they're just they're not growing to the sapling stage and, and older. Is it? They're just not out competing uh, the deer feeding pressure that, that's on site. Numerous fencing studies have been done around New York State, and they all show pretty much the same results. If you've got a stand that's getting adequate light, uh, less than, say, 50, 60 percent canopy cover, where you've got a good amount of sunlight reaching the forest floor. Within two or three years after you put a fence up to exclude deer, you see dramatic changes in vegetation inside and outside the fence. And so uh, these fences are useful from a research standpoint. They're also useful from an extension education standpoint. So uh, people can understand what the driving forces are for forest regeneration in New York and other states. Uh, Quirin and Blossy have a, some work that they are putting out now. I'm going to just briefly touch on it here, and then I'm going to come back to this study again in a little while. Uh, this is a preliminary data that uh, Brendan Quirian shared with me based on uh, recent research that he's been doing with Dr. Baron Blossie in our Department of Natural Resources and the Environment. And they're looking at indicators of ecological change and what an indicator of ecological change should do is provide a simple and efficient measurement of key conditions, processes that characterize ecosystems, component structure, and function. And so AVID and many of the other vegetation sampling protocols are, are nothing more than an indicator of ecological changes that we think are important for forest regeneration. So the question is, have sampling protocols uh, been reliably looked at and validated? Do they really show what we expect them to show in terms of indicators of brow severity? And I want to refer to a paper by uh, Dale and Byler in 2001 published in Ecological Indicators, uh, where they document challenges in developing and the use of these types of indicators. So what makes effective criteria of an ecological indicator based on Dale and Byler? Well, first, it should be easily measured. It should be sensitive to stretches on the system, whether it's deer browsing or acid rain or whatever the stressor is that's on a specific system. It should respond in a predictable manner so that we can use it for predicting future change. It should be anticipatory, it needs to be relative to management, should be able to integrate it across different uh, species, should have a well-studied pattern of response and have low variability in the response so that uh, uh, it has a low variance so you can make uh, statistic statistical prediction. And uh, what Dale and Byler found is that many management monitoring programs lack scientific rigor because they don't use this sort of defined protocol for identifying uh, important parameters of ecological indicators. And we'll come back to this more in a little bit. Many existing protocols for assessing deer crowd impacts. And I'll just list some of the uh, more recent, more commonly used methods uh, down the left panel. Uh, again, we're going to talk initially about AVID, assessing vegetation impacts of deer. Uh, but we're going to get into several of these other methods, uh, uh, the Sentinel approach, the twig gauge, and the 10 tallest to be specific and a bit more detail later on. But I just want uh, folks to be aware that there's a number of different protocols that have been recommended over years to evaluate deer impacts to forest regeneration. So let's focus on AVID for a few minutes. Our objectives when we're developing the protocol were to assess deer impacts on forest regeneration to help DEC with setting deer management goals uh, uh, for rural forest lands. Currently, there's few on the ground data available for DEC to set uh, regulations and know what's happening uh, as far as regeneration goes in the forest. The forest inventory analysis data collected by the Forest Service is valuable. The plots are usually only sampled every five years, and only a subset of those have uh, regeneration plots. So, even though it's a, 
a good long-term data set. It's very valuable. It doesn't serve the need well for uh, looking at year-to-year uh, -year changes and potential uh, deer harvest regulations and deer harvest rates. So DEC partnered with Cooperative Extension to develop a citizen science program to better understand the impacts of deer browsing in, in more real time than are available with the FIA database. If you're gonna use AVID, first you gotta select an appropriate site and stand on your property. Uh, you want to, don't wanna to have too steep a slope or too much rock cover. You wanna have uh, sites that are accessible for deer for where they can browse and vegetation is gonna grow well. You also want to avoid areas where ferns, grasses, and, and basic species dominate much of the site. Ideally, with AVID, uh, particularly for the tree seedlings, you want an open canopy or uh, an area where the open where the canopy and subcanopy is 50% is ideal. So you've got enough sunlight reaching the forest floor where you'd expect to find seedling growth. Uh, AVID was designed so the uh, the woody seedlings uh, work best in these open stands, and it also has a wildflower component, and we recommend using the wildflower component if you've got more closed canopy stands uh, with insufficient sunlight reaching the forest floor. To set up plots, uh, ideally, you want to uh, have six circular plots in each forest stand and have five tag seedlings of the same tree species, whichever species tends to be most prevalent on a site. Mark and measure 30 seedlings of the same species. Uh, so six plots at five seedlings each is, as 30 per stand. Plot centers should be about 25 feet, feet apart. You can locate your plots along a transect if it makes it easier for you to find and, and resample them, but it's really not necessary. And I'll show you some photos uh, here in a moment of how we mark our plots so that we can easily find and, and get back to them. We mark plots uh, with a, a PVC pipe, uh, white pipe uh, painted blaze orange on the top and, and uh, label those with a, a permanent sharpening marker to mark the plot center. Uh, plots can be randomly located, but uh, usually what we encourage landowners to do is select uh, areas and stand where there's sufficient uh, seedlings of, of a single species to measure, so uh, not use random selection. You want to record canopy cover and the dominant species in the overstory. I also like to mark each of the cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, with a wooden stake at the six foot radius out, so I know uh, what the uh, outside perimeter of the circle is at. You can tie a string of a six foot radius. Uh, to the PVC pipe, then you and just and uh, quickly measure that off. And then uh, this is helpful when it comes back to relocate tag seedlings. If you know which quadrant the seedlings you're looking for, and it makes it much uh, faster to, to relocate and measure those in subsequent years. For each of the tag seedlings, uh, you want to measure height to the highest point of woody growth from ground level. And what we're looking for with AVID is changes in height growth from year to year. The assumption is if uh, woody seedlings aren't browsed by deer uh, and you've got adequate light in uh, uh, decent soil conditions, those seedlings be, should be putting on uh, height growth each year. We tend to look at things in groups of either preferred or some of the, the less preferred species and the preferred species which deer seem to seek out in many of our uh, New York forests are things like yellow birch, uh, oak, red and sugar maples, and white ash. And some of the less preferred species are American beech, uh, horn bean, hop horn bean, striped maple, things like that. Uh, if you have chronic deer over browsing and stand for many years. Sometimes the preferred species, uh, even though they might be present in the overstory, are almost absent at ground level and, and if their regeneration has been impacted by deer. We have a website online, uh, aviddeer.com, and you can register to sign up if you want to put plots on your own property and assess deer impacts on, on in your own forest stands. I, I, encourage folks to consider doing that so you know what's happening on your property. 
we encourage uh, our volunteer landowners to uh, sample the plots once a year, try to do it within two weeks of uh, uh, the initial date plots are put in. So if you're sampling uh, seedlings about the same time of year each year, it's ideal and you can do it for at least a three year minimum. Uh, so you can start to see uh, changes in growth if they're occurring over time. And during this last year, we just developed a, a new mobile app. So once you have uh, data available, you're registered on the website, uh, you can download uh, your previous year data on the mobile app and it makes it easier to, to load data in real time in the field. If your stands in a remote location where you don't have cell phone access, as long as you download uh, your data and get last year's information on your mobile device uh, while you've got uh, internet access or, or wireless access, uh, then you can take that uh, those data to the field and actually do the sampling of your plots without internet access. And then when you get back uh, uh, home or another spot where you've got internet access, if you uh, log into the site again, uh, those data can be uploaded and added to the database. At several sites around New York, we establish uh, deer enclosures to prevent deer browsing. Uh, they provide a good comparison of what would happen in the absence of deer browsing. What type of plant growth could we expect if we take deer out of the picture? And it really helps us to assess what the uh, the different characteristics of seedling growth and what growth rates are expected for different uh, tree and, and shrub species in, in New York State. Uh, I'm going to share some data that we analyzed uh, a year or so ago. We currently have avid plots at, in more than 24 counties across New York and at 83 active, more than 83 active sites. And we have 10 sites uh, where we've got paired fenced and unfenced plots. And those are the ones that we use for uh, this analysis that I'm going to share. You can see quite a few of them in South Central New York and a few in uh, uh, upstate uh, in, in northern or northern New York and in uh, northern Hudson River Valley. What we did is we looked at growth rates for different species combinations at each site. Uh, so we've got uh, 15 site species combinations. Uh, the red lines are uh, seedlings that were within a fence exclosure on the site. Uh, the blue lines are the growth rates for seedlings outside the exclosure. Any uh, box for the species site combinations that it has the asterisk, those are significantly greater growth rates within the fence areas as you, as you would predict. So for example, at our uh, Broome County site, we didn't see significant differences in black cherry growth, but we saw very significant differences for red oak. Uh, at our Essex site, we didn't see differences again for red oak, uh, but at the uh, gas line site in Schuyler County, uh, we did. And so you can look at different species site combinations, but um, basically this shows that uh, deer impacts to seedling growth are widespread across New York State. And, Again, 12 of the 15 species site combination we looked at had very significant differences in growth inside and outside of the fence. We looked at our statistical analyses. Uh, protection status, fenced or not, was highly significantly different. Year was also significantly different. And again, site species combinations uh, were significantly different. And all the interaction terms uh, ended up being significant. So we see drastic differences, uh, much more rapid growth inside fences uh, uh, for the seedlings that we had tagged at multiple sites. We look at actual what was the percent growth. Different tree species grow at different rates and different uh, sites and stands are at different ages. And so that uh, we had to look at percent growth rather than actual growth uh, to make uh, comparisons across stands and sites. And we found a very interesting pattern when we looked across all of our uh, 15 site species combinations. Uh, for sugar maple, we saw an average of about 27% growth over uh, three years. Uh, when we were looking at inside the fence, 
versus an average at 8% growth outside the fence. And you can see the, the, the not a huge amount of variability at the, the, the five different sites where we have measured sugar maple. For red oak, we had that occurring on four sites where we had fenced exclosures. Again, the average growth rate for red oak averaged 27% at fence sites uh, versus 8% uh, for those uh, seedlings exposed to deer browsing. Red maple uh, occurred on two sites, uh, 20% average growth rate. White ash occurred on two sites, again, about 20% average growth rate. Uh, black cherry and broom didn't perform as, as we had expected, I think partly due to a breach in, in one of the enclosures there. But uh, uh, for most species site combination, we found a, a fairly interesting pattern that average growth seedling growth rates, if they average less than 10%, uh, that was an indicator that uh, deer browsing was likely excessive on site and impacting seedling growth. Now I'd like to switch back. I mentioned uh, Brendan Quirin and Bern Blossie. They've got a, a manuscript that's in prep right now and I wanna share some of the preliminary data. I contacted Brendan uh, uh, last week, and he uh, shared uh, these slides with me. So again, I want to share them with you. Uh, the goal of his research was to look at four of the common protocols designed to assess deer browsing impacts uh, through citizen science approaches and uh, look at their varying strengths and weaknesses and, and, and what appeared to work best. So the methods he looked at are Tom Rowinski's 10 tallest method, our work with AVID, uh, the twig age method developed by Don Waller, and uh, the Sentinel approach developed by uh, Byrne Glossy. So briefly run through the way each of these methods work with the 10 tallest. Uh, you can use it with tree seedlings, shrubs, or herbaceous plants, uh, really any type of vegetation you have out there that's uh, less than 1.2 meters high. You set up a a uh, 5.6 meter radius plot and we me measure the 10 tallest uh, woody seedling stems or for flowering species, the total number of fertile uh, stems within each plot. And uh, selection of plots is based on availability of vegetation and there's no set number of plots per site, just based on uh, availability of, of vegetation. So with AVID, as we've discussed, uh, we're targeting tree seedlings less than a meter and a half uh, in height for the deer browsing uh, reach. That's in more open canopy stands. And then we're targeting three uh, uh, preferred uh, wildflower species in close canopy stands, trillium, Indian cucumber, and jack in the pulpit. Jack in the pulpit. Uh, what we want to measure is natural plant height and proportion flowering on the wildflower. And we want to assess the same 25 to 30 stems in uh, six circular plots of 1.8 meters or six foot radius. And again, selection is based on availability of vegetation. And you've got to go where there's openings in the canopy where there's sufficient stems to measure. The twig age method uh, is focused on seedlings of woody tree species, uh, intermediate palatability of deer, less than 1.8 meters in height. Uh, twig age is assessed in years on two twigs per stem and on 50, 60 stems per species along a straight line or belt transect across the plot. And depending on the uh, number of seedlings or, and stems measured, you know, usually set up one to three random transects in a stand to reach that 50, 60 sample size that you're targeting. And for the twig age method, uh, you see normal growth and, and uh, bud scars and, and new growth. So you can sort out uh, twigs that are growing under, under normal conditions and go back and measure uh, number of years between deer browsing. And on stems that have repeated uh, deer browsing, you can see the sort of this witcher's broom effect and, and where deer have been impacted. So you can count back and, and see how many years it's been uh, to the last incident of deer browsing on a, on a woody twig. The sentinel approach uh, developed by Baron Blossie uh, 
looks at planted red oak seedlings initially, but also he's looking at a blue stem goldenrod now as possibly a more sensitive uh, flower uh, for sort of an herb indicator on plots. Um, what you want to look at is proportion of plants browsed by deer and Blossy also looks at those attacked by rodents and invertebrates and records flowering, plant height, and overwinter survival. You have 20 individuals of a species planted along a transect at one meter increments and uh, they're assessed over a single growing season. So uh, this approach is very different from the others. The last three approaches rely on existing vegetation. So if you're in a woods that's been very chronically overbrowsed by deer, maybe closed canopy situation, sometimes it's very difficult to find enough uh, vegetation or seedlings to sample. Although well, Sentinel works very well in these types of situations because you're putting new plant materials out there and it provides a very consistent measure of deer damage uh, from year to year on, on plant and seedlings. That means, though, that the seedling, whether you're going to be using things like uh, goldenrod as an herb or red oak as a woody species, those have to be uh, propagated each year and grown in a, in a greenhouse and then have those available for planting out in the spring. So this is the one, one drawback of the sentinel approach is that you've got to have seedlings available. And so uh, for this to be widely used, we need to have seed sources for uh, consistent seed sources of nursery stocks or have availability to uh, create your own seed sources as, as Dr. Blossy does. Once you have the materials available, uh, the transects are laid out in uh, uh, across the stand. Uh, use a, a cordless auger drill uh, to drill a hole. The plants are grown in uh, containers and flats, so you can easily lift a, a seedling or, or an herb species from the container, drop it in uh, to the hole that's drilled by, uh, uh, by the drill bit, and then uh, uh, push the soil in around it so the roots get good uh, soil contact and, and then monitor them. Each plant is tagged, as you can see in the far right photo, with a a uh, metal washer with a, uh, a galvanized nail through it, put it right at the base of each seedling in the way uh, Blossy and uh, Aquarian uh, remeasured seedlings and found them each year is to use a metal detector and quickly run the transect and look for the, uh, the washers. And that takes you quickly to each seedling so they can be measured to look at height growth and percent flowering on, on the herb species. We look at results uh, based on uh, Aquarian and Blossy's work. This was all done on uh, five large uh, fence stands uh, in and around the Ithaca area in central New York. Uh, these are large fence stands, they're about five acres in size with deer proof plastic fencing around each one. And then adjacent to those stands are where the uh, control plots were established outside the fences. So when uh, Crane and Blossy looked at the AVID results uh, of the five stands that they surveyed, these are all older growth closed canopy stands uh, with no recent uh, timber harvest. Uh, American Beach was the only woody seedling that was abundant enough to measure. It was available at four of the five sites. They could do random plot selection at three sites, uh, but then had to rely on subjective plot selection for one additional site to get a total of 48 plots. Um, the blue stem goldenrod, which is a very good um, sentinel herb to look at deer browsing pressure to wildflower. It was only available at one site and they had used subjective plot selection. So there weren't enough data for analyses and trilliums uh, naturally occurred at two of the five sites. Well, and they were able to set up uh, 20 plots using subjective plot selection. So we do have data for AVID and Trillium. AVID and Tentalis root methods, uh, since they both use circular plots, they're both set up uh, subjectively for the most part, uh, uh, were sampled in the same areas in these five stands. So uh, Crane and Blossy compared uh, AVID and Tentalis. 
And what they found with uh, the American beech, Fagus grandifolia, 10 tallest did not detect significant differences in height growth inside and outside the fence, whereas the AVID method did, similar to what we've seen in other stands. In terms of uh, trillion species uh, height, uh, both methods uh, detected significant differences in trillium height inside and outside the fences. When you look at proportion flowering or total flowering, again, both AVID and Tentalis uh, showed significant differences between fenced and unfenced plots in uh, uh, flowering. Uh, so both methods worked well uh, on, on trillium. And if we go back and look at the criteria we talked about early on for selecting ecological indicators, uh, you can uh, go back and start to evaluate these methods uh, and do comparisons across the different methods. So the AVID data have been published in an article in uh, Forest Ecology Management in uh, 2021, so you can refer to that. In terms of the criteria, uh, for ecological indicator uh, and for woody vegetation for seedlings for avid they're easily measured we don't know if there's sensitive decesses in the, in the system that's unknown right now it would take a mani manipulative experiment where we change deer density drastically and look and see how quickly avid would respond to those changes in deer density so at this point it's unknown uh, the seedlings did respond to uh, stress uh, the deer browsing in a, in a predictable manner, in a consistent manner. Uh, we don't know if it's anticipatory, if we can predict future change. It's relative management. Ended up not being integrated because we could use both uh, seedlings and wildflowers. Not enough wildflower data have been submitted to the AVID database. Uh, we've got a studied pattern of response and a low variability response. So having meets most of the criteria for an ecological indicator, at least for woody vegetation. For herbs, uh, it didn't meet the criteria because we didn't find enough existing uh, wildflowers to measure on most of the plots. Uh, the herb did respond to stress in a predictable manner, relevant to management, and it's not integrated. We don't have enough data to know if it uh, can be, uh, to say that it's well studied because we've had so few wildflower data turned into the database and it did have a low variability of response. For 10 tallest, if we go back to those same ecological indicators, they're easily measured, uh, but the criteria wasn't measured for herb. It took a, a lot of time to figure out what are the actual 10 uh, tallest uh, when you got into dense uh, undergrowth of, of herb. Uh, we don't know if it's sensitive to stresses on the system and how it responds to changes in deer impact. It, for woody vegetation, it did not expand, respond in a predictable manner. Uh, Ten tallest couldn't detect changes in American beech growth inside and outside the fences and also didn't meet it for, for herbs. We don't know if it's anticipatory. I uh, don't believe the Tentalis is going to be relative, uh, relevant to manage it. It's integrated, can use it on, on woodies and in herbaceous vegetation. It doesn't have uh, published peer reviewed uh, literature, uh, so it's not well studied pattern of response. And But it did have a low variability of response. So again, this method met some of the criteria for the ecological indicators, but didn't fare quite as well as AVID did. Results of the twig aid. Uh, again, uh, American beech was available at four of the five fence sites uh, in and around the Ithaca area. Striped male, maple was available at two sites, and ash was available at one site. Uh, the twig age method did a very good job of predicting uh, excessive deer browsing, and we saw significant differences inside and outside the fence based on twig ages for all three of the species at the, the sites that they were available. And so when we look at the, the twig age method and go back uh, to ecological indicators, it, it performed 
relatively well across the board uh, for woody vegetation. Uh, the one thing that we don't know is that, uh, again, uh, it's not designed for herb. We're not using it for wildflower. So this is a method that's only available uh, for woodly seedlings, but it, it performed relatively well. In the sentinel approach, um, the species that responded most significantly to changes in deer browsing inside the fence were the blue stem uh, golden, goldenrod, and you can see here in the second graph. In, uh, in this uh, study in 2021, uh, there wasn't a significant digger, difference in height of red oak inside out, and outside of the fence plots. So, um, this work then published a couple of different articles, uh, one on the red oak seedling uh, uh, by Barron uh, in Ecology and Evolution, and another one uh, on some of the herb stuff in, in the upper right. So of all the methods we looked at, the Sentinel approach met the greatest number of ecological indicator criteria that was easily measured for both uh, woody species and herbs. It responded in a predictable manner for both. For woody vegetation, the red oak paper on the upper left uh, showed that it was sensitive to stress on the system. Uh, when we looked at differences in deer densities, that's one of the few studies where we had uh, good data on deer densities under different conditions. Um, we don't know if that would be met for herbs. Still don't know if it's anticipatory anticipatory, it's relevant to management, integrative. Uh, it's got a well-studied pattern response and a low variability uh, of response. So uh, we need more data on the herb side to say that uh, uh, the blue stem goldenrod will work as a, as a good ecological indicator for herb. But uh, the data that uh, Brendan and Barron collected this past year are very encouraging. So the Sentinel has, has a lot of strengths. Uh, Brendan also recorded the average time required for one person to complete uh, the protocol for one species at each site and uh, found out that the most time consuming process ended up being the 10 tallest. It took on average about 220 minutes for one person to, to set up and, and sample plots. And a lot of that time has to do with uh, finding plots to, to select. And then once you find them, going back and measuring individual to determine which are the 10 tallest. Avid took on average about uh, 124 minutes, Twigade similar about 118 minutes, so a couple hours to set up a sample set up plot. And similar to uh, Oak Sentinel, again, about 114 minutes to, to set up and sample plots. But that doesn't include the time required to, to propagate the seedlings that you, that you plan out. So uh, that would be an, added time cost for the Sentinel approach. So why did 10 avid detect a significant differences across the fence and uh, American beach growth when the 10 tallest did not using the exact same location? And uh, based on this paper by Bryce, Green uh, and Blossy suspect that targeting only the tallest plants likely overestimates uh, regeneration and growth. Uh, they found in this uh, uh, example with uh, trophy cascades in, in the Western US, uh, because when you sample only the tallest individuals, you're sampling the fastest growing, most robust plants rather than a random sample of plants. And so it, it tends not to pick up on some of the changes in growth rates that you might expect. One of the questions uh, the study raises, both studies actually raise, is are the tree species available really what we can expect in our future forests? And this is really what we want to measure. We know that in the future with emerald ash borer, ash is going to be much less dominant in the future forests. Uh, we know uh, with beech bark disease and uh, uh, over browsing by deer and the fact that American beech is a, a very low preferred species that we see a lot of beech seedlings and samplings in the understory of the forest across many parts of New York State. 
Uh, but this may or may not match what's in the overstory and probably doesn't match what we want to grow. So one of the drawbacks of using existing uh, vegetation as sample uh, and deer impacts the forest regeneration, you only can work with what you have at ground level. And what's at ground level may or may not reflect what's in the overstory. So we may be missing some impacts that are really important. Uh, again, that's where the Sentinel approach is, is stronger because it can pick up some of these uh, browsing impacts and changes in the uh, to deer feeding pressure uh, that might not be seen in a highly resistant browse species like American beech. So just to summarize some of the findings uh, from the querying and glossy work, uh, hopefully they're going to get this published this fall, so uh, we'll have a a uh, citation that I can share, but uh, you need to use caution when selecting a protocol to measure deer impact and make sure that it's been experimentally validated and peer reviewed and it's going to be as robust as uh, an indicators expect in your woodland situation. Again, there's a lot of things out there. They don't all work equally well. Each of the four protocol that Crane and Velocity evaluated can meet some of the criteria of ecological indicator, uh, but the Sentinel approach had the greatest potential to meet them all. And so again, if you've got um, accessibility to, to seedlings or herbs that you can plan out, the Sentinel approach has a lot of merit. Uh, but again, that's going to be the drawback is to getting uh, production of larger numbers of seedlings or saplings that it'll be useful for evaluating uh, growth across many forest stands. Avid and tentals, we found were less likely to be the effective indicators in closed canopy forest or where there's a, a chronic or a history of chronic deer overbrowning, overbrowsing pressure. Uh, one, uh, the tentals again has a bias, so it doesn't always pick up uh, the changes in growth rate. And both methods fail when you've got very little vegetation to measure. Even choosing selective uh, plots, sometimes non-random plot, on uh, some stands, it's difficult to find enough seedlings, existing seedlings to measure. And so in those type of situations where there's very, very little existing vegetation, uh, the twig age or the sentinel approach may perform better. Additional research is uh, needed to evaluate the ability of all these different protocols to be anticipatory and sensitive to change in deer prowl severity. We need real manipulative experiments where we go out and we're measuring deer density and changing deer densities on the landscape to see how these protocols respond. We really have very little data that shows how uh, well these, change, these protocols might uh, respond to change in deer density. There could be lag effects that could last many years after changing deer density that might not show up with these indicators, but we don't know that without doing the manipulative types of experiments. And uh, just to summarize the average set, AVID protocol, you now two studies, both our own and the aquarium velocity study, significant differences in ceiling height growth for vents, fence versus unfenced plots. Deer damage to seedlings was widespread in New York State. 12 of our 15 species site combination in eight counties where we had fencing showed uh, deer impacts to seedling growth. We did find uh, that if seedling growth rates were about less than 10% for three or more years, that was a red flag. That's an indicator that deer browsing pressure or some other stress around the system excessive and limiting seedling growth. And we found that AVID performs best at sites where uh, sunlight is reaching the forest floor, where you'd expect to see forest regeneration. And uh, uh, at least with seedling growth, AVID didn't perform quite as well as we'd hoped under very close canopy areas with a uh, history of chronic deer overbrowsing. Um, and with that, I'll close in uh, Peter, and we can open it up for, for questions from folks in the audience. Oh, great job. That was a lot of fun. So <laughs> I, I enjoyed that. Um, so 
there have been a few questions come in and I've answered some of them and, and you like there's a question on time requirements and I, I was glad to see that my experience matched up with what Brendan found in his study. So if, if uh, so some of them have been answered. If there are others, this is a great time if people want to uh, go ahead and start typing in their questions. Yeah, while folks are doing that, I just want to talk briefly about the future of AVID. Uh, our goal is to try to get 100 ag AVID sites for WMU aggregate, or a total of about 2,300 sites statewide. And the map on the on the lower left shows the WMU aggregates across New York State. Uh, so we're actively involved uh, with workshops and training uh, landowner volunteers uh, to go out and collect sites. We strongly encourage folks to collect sites so you can see what's happening on your own property. Uh, Christy Sullivan is uh, the contact at Cornell. Uh, Christy and uh, Tracy are, are working on setting up quite a few of our AVID trainings right now. There have been several ongoing this month so far, and there'll be more as, as summer goes on. Uh, but we want to get as many folks as we can um, using either AVID or some form of, of sampling, deer damage to forest regeneration. It's going to be important in the future. It's going to help, uh, hopefully, help DEC uh, determine uh, antlerless deer tag quotas and deer harvest rates for various parts of the state to try to improve the regeneration situation. Very good. So, if you anybody has questions. So Celine says all of the areas at her site are greater than 80% canopy cover with few wildflowers. There are lots of deer around and wants to know if AVID is still an option. AVID is still an option, uh, even at, at closed canopy cover. Uh, if you don't have wildflowers to measure, uh, and you may not, and if with closed canopies and and if you've got high deer browsing pressure on site, you may not have enough wildflowers to measure. We found that on, on several of our stands in and around the Ithaca area uh, when we were looking at those. It just it, simply wildflowers are uh, just not existing because of the deer browsing pressure. You can see what woody seedlings you have if you have uh, sufficient numbers of, uh, of a single species. Avid would still work. Your growth rates are probably going to be a bit slower under more of a closed canopy because you're not getting the light to the forest floor that you would otherwise have with a more open canopy. But I would still try AVID and maybe compare it to one of the other methods. Uh, the twig age method in particular seems to work very well under uh, closed canopy. And the reason for that is with a twig age method when there, you don't have the light to the forest floor that allows seedlings to put on their rapid vertical growth. Uh, a lot of times the twigs will still grow horizontally under low light and uh, the uh, twig age method still picks up that growth. And so it seemed to work relatively well in the closed canopy stand that we had in and around Ithaca. So Celine's situation might also be another uh, opportunity if, if uh, she was able to install some fencing to be able to do a comparison in the presence and absence of deer using AVID. So yeah, that'd be that another, in, 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 another yeah, interesting that contrast. Be. Yep. All the right. Fencing Jeff. is always helpful uh, because, uh, again, you can see what's possible in a stand. It doesn't have to be a large area either. Uh, just a uh, fencing, as long as you've got area where there's some lighting hitting the forest floor, it could you know, be. Uh, six or eight feet on a side, it could be circular, it could be square, as long as it's at least uh, six or seven feet high so deer can't easily get into it. Uh, you'll fairly quickly see if you've got lighting hitting the forest floor, whether or not deer are impacting seedling growth on your property. Yeah, the, the picture you showed, Paul, the graphic, the schematic showed all six plots within a fence, and that's, that's certainly one option, but we've, uh, you and I and Christy and uh, Mike have set up other areas where we have an unprotected avid plot, just the six foot radius adjacent to a fenced, a very small uh, 
area fenced for the protected um, AVID plot. So there's there's different ways you can configure based on uh, you know where where you decide to locate your plots. Yeah, I think the most important thing is getting out in the woods and, and looking, knowing what your impacts are on your property. Are you seeing brown? Are you seeing uh, a good diversity of species in the in the deer molar zone, less than six feet in height, or are you seeing only deer resistant species? Just taking a walk through the woods and and paying close attention, you can learn a lot. Okay, Jeff uh, saw that you mentioned the use of AVID for setting deer management goals and wants to know if this is if the results are being correlated with deer management recommendations and deer harvest recommendations. Uh, that's a future goal. They're not being used at this point. We don't have enough plots yet statewide. Uh, the research data we've collected so far are very encouraging. It looks like AVID's going to work well for that, uh, but we need a much larger number of plots, uh, uh, not only within specific uh, wildlife management unit aggregates, uh, but across aggregates. And so at this point, uh, we really need to recruit a large number of volunteers. Uh, in order to get the sample size up where uh, DEC would feel comfortable um, setting deer harvest goals and, and quotas on uh, forest regeneration data from AVID. We're, we're not there yet, but that, that's the future. Okay, Boria has an island, a 16 acre island in the middle of a stream, and he wants to know if deer, uh, he knows a deer can cross it, nibble at tree growth, but uh, would a fairly substantial stream discourage deer accessing that island? Uh, my experience is that deer swim very well and uh, a stream or even a river is probably not going to keep deer from crossing. I've seen uh, deer cross fairly major deep high flow rivers. I've seen some of our tag deer across uh, uh, Long Island Sound uh, between North and South Fork of Long Island. Uh, between Shelter Island and particularly North Fork. And I still hard for me to believe that they swim across there, but they do because we had deer that we tagged on Shelter Island end up on, on both North and South Forks. Uh, uh, and to get to the North Fork, they had to swim the channel. Those are, those are the special deer with their webbed hooves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Nathan wants, Nathan says, does it seem like regeneration can be safely generalized at the GMU aggregate level? So that's, I'm assuming the aggregate of the management units, um, or do you think browsing impacts occur at a more local scale than that? Browsing impacts definitely occur at a, at a local scale, but I think if we get a large enough sample size, you know, we got, you know, a hundred different sites with avid plots, and, um, we can start to get a decent picture of what it likes on a broader unit scale, but you know, definitely you see differences in browsing pressure site to site based on deer density, species composition, the amount of alternate forage available, is there cropland available? So many different factors on a given site uh, that influence deer browsing pressure. Um, so yes, it occurs on a very specific locale based on all these different variables, but I still think it, it can be aggregated on a larger scale with a sufficient sample size. Okay, and then a follow-up question is, if you have general thoughts on the quality of data from citizen science projects that involve these uh, more uh, involved data collection protocols, maybe, I don't know if you wanna, what your familiarity, Paul, is with the different methods, but are there, how do you think the citizen science would work with some of these methods that you mentioned. Okay, I think for both AVID and 10 Tallis, these approaches are, are, are very simple. Basically, if you can measure with a, a ruler and a tape measure, and you know, I can identify common tree seedling species like uh, oak, ash, maple, beech, uh, uh, these, these systems work and then we get uh, very good data. The twig age method is also not difficult. There's a little bit of a learning curve, uh, reading the bud scars and getting used to that. But once you've done it a few times, that one's fairly straightforward and simple. Uh, the sentinel one is also straightforward and easy. The, the diff difficult part of the sentinel approach is uh, 
the planting and the, uh, the propagation and, and the planting of the individual seedlings and then uh, needing the, you know, the, the extra equipment if you're using the metal washers and nails and, and plant tags, you've got to have a metal detector. So that adds a little bit more complication to it. But all these approaches are fairly straightforward. They're not that difficult and with very minimal training uh, in just about any volunteer can, can learn how to do these things. It's really, you know, what are your resources? And the biggest one is often time. Do you have time to get out there and, and follow through and sample as needed uh, once a year, every year, so you can see what's actually happening in, in your woodlot? Okay. Leola um, mentioned this is an observation. I don't know if you want to comment on it. Uh, the hemorrhagic disease seems to have reduced the deer population to have allowed native wildflowers to come back that uh, wild plants that they haven't seen in years. So is that, so maybe just more generally about annual fluctuations in deer populations and what your sense is on uh, disease incidents or other kinds of factors that would, that would drive deer population fluctuations? Yeah. The Episodic hemorrhagic disease outbreaks in New York State were uh, much greater last year than we've seen in other years. And there were localized areas where the deer impacts were significant. I mean, there was uh, fairly substantial mortality. I don't know actual total numbers estimated across the state or percent in Pacific region, but uh, there were uh, many dead deer in different parts of New York State, which is unusual. Uh, Hemorrhagic disease has always been thought of as a more southern deer disease, but we got the right combination of, of um, heat and temperature. It's spread by an insect biting mid and insect abundance, so that we had a, a more significant outbreak than usual. So, definitely, I could see at a specific site where deer might be impacted severely enough that it will allow some uh, short term vegetation growth. Uh, but it usually, EHD is very sporadic. We don't see it every year. And so if we go several years again without another uh, major outbreak, um, those deer populations will likely rebound fairly quickly. And so the, the wildflower growth that you may have seen this year, if those deer populations rebound quickly, could be fairly important. Okay. Uh, Thomas wants to know uh, what involvement the biologists have in uh, helping to identify and set deer harvest levels? Uh, BEC uh, sets up deer harvest levels uh, for each of, the each of the wildlife management units. And it's based on harvest data reported. Uh, they've got a, a system and a formula based on uh, buck take index, buck take per square mile index that's used to uh, provide an estimate of deer abundance and depending how that buck take index fluctuates, uh, the biologists can adjust analyst harvest uh, quotas accordingly. So if the goal is to, to decrease deer numbers, then they'll increase the number of antlerless tags available. If the goal is to, uh, to stabilize deer numbers, then there may be no change in, in the antlerless tag quota. So it's adjusted annually based on the the prior year's harvest and the, the buck take per square mile index. Okay, Rich wants to know in these areas around this around New York, where we're having uh, currently pretty heavy gypsy moth defoliation and the understories uh, responding favorably. If we should, uh, if he should sit out, should pause or delay testing until the gypsy moth populations crash, or would that really matter? Uh, by delay testing, I am assuming he's talking about putting out avid plots. In, uh, right, right. Uh, you know, I would, you know, I would go ahead and put them out. In gypsy moth or no gypsy moth. The only thing that would happen if you've got time when the defoliation is high, you're going to get more light to the forest floor, and you expect a little more rapid seedling growth. But overall, it's better to to not delay and go ahead and put those out at a time when it's going to be convenient for you to sample those plots each year. Okay. Uh, Thomas wants to know if you have looked at the browse availability meth method, such as amount of regeneration cuts on the landscape 
um, and wants to know if this, I'm assuming the deer impact is a transitional issue because of New York's agriculture um, and higher deer capacity leaving the landscape uh, and it's overwhelming the landscape with minimum forestry. So maybe just comment on the kind of the landscape patterns and, and where, whether deer population changes are gonna, how those might flux in response to landscape patterns. Okay. The deer over browsing that we see in many parts of the state is, is, is a long-term pattern. I mean, you can go back uh, more than a decade now to the Nature Conservancy reports and our own Cornell Forester Survey and, and deer were causing significant impacts then and, and had been for many years prior to that. So I don't expect to see a uh, very uh, much change long term in terms of, of deer browsing pressure. Um, I, you mentioned browse availability and again the the size of, uh, of a timber harvest, for example. Uh, there was data from the Adirondacks years ago. Uh, I can't remember who did the work at ESF right offhand, but it showed that you needed to cut uh, plots of a certain size in order to try to overwhelm the, the deer that were there uh, with browse so that some of the seedlings would survive and have good regeneration. And that's, that seemed to work in many cases. And I think it would work in the Adirondack or deer densities are generally lower than they are in other parts of the state, but where you have very high deer densities in lower Hudson Valley and Long Island and much of central and southern New York, I'm not sure the, uh, that the, the cutting size, although it has an influence, would work quite as well as it did with that, that uh, older research in the Adirondacks. Okay, uh, Patrick makes an observation that it seems like fencing is the answer um, to fence large areas, but that the costs are high. And I'll just, I'll respond and say that Paul and Brett Chedzoy and I have been working on a protocol that use uh, logging debris, low grade trees and logging slash to create barriers around the perimeter of harvest areas. Um, and we've had some webinars on that. So if you go to the YouTube channel for Forest Connect you can see more about uh, deer protection methods. Um, Jean wants to know how deer impact research is integrating or not integrating, uh, given the other um, array of things that are impacting the environment. Paul, do you want to talk about kind of Cornell's broader, how, how research happens and the role of deer impact research versus climate change research or other kinds of research. Yeah, Peter, you're probably better prepared to respond to that, but you know, uh, deer impact research is just one of many things that Cornell is looking at, at the, across the landscape. I know, Peter, you're involved with the slash wall work and carbon sequestration work and deer impacts are just another one of many stressors such as climate change and many other factors in the environment. And uh, at least from a tree regeneration standpoint, deer are one of the important factors because it's something that potentially we can control or manage uh, through hunting, through fencing, through, through other management alternatives, or we probably are going to have uh, fewer uh, avenues to try to impact things like climate change in the short term. Yep, I, and I, that's a perfect response. I'd just say that Cornell, and I, I think most other institutions are involved in a full range of um, research projects and, and many of the issues that are identified in Gene's question are all um, integrated at some level. And so being able to identify how deer impact interfaces with some of these other issues is an important part of answering the bigger question. Okay. All right, Thomas, so there are several like kind of observations that people are making that I'm not reading through just in the, in the uh, because of time. Um, so just the questions, Thomas says, how does AVID address sites uh, subject to regular forestry such as logging operations versus non-managed successional forests, so early successional or old growth forests, et cetera? Um, wants to know if, uh, someone 
one of the earlier uh, successional tree species. Uh, so maybe uh, there's a kind of a second question or statement with that that I'm not understanding. So how does how does the avid apply in forests with different disturbance histories and different points on the successional spectrum? Yeah, avid's going to work well, I believe, as long as you've got uh, adequate light reaching the forest floor. And so you know, in areas where you would expect regeneration. So particularly early successional forests where you've got a lot of uh, potential vegetation that's in, in within the reach of deer and deer browsing, as long, uh, avid should work well. The one situation I think avid may not work particularly well is when you've got uh, old growth, closed canopy, mature forest. Uh, one, you're going to have very little vegetation at ground level probably to start. And two, that vegetation that is at ground level is probably going to be going, growing at a very slow rate uh, because of the lack of sunlight that reaches the forest floor. So uh, that's the situation where I probably wouldn't recommend avid, but I'm not. I don't think we see all that many old growth stands across much of New York State nowadays. Correct. Um, there were several people that responded to the earlier comment about deer swimming, and they also have the webbed hooved deer in their areas. Uh, uh, so Lynn wants to know from a New England perspective, Lynn's, if I remember correctly, a forester in Vermont, um, wants to know how many avid plots or arrays so the cluster of the six, I call those six plots an array, a cluster of plot array, um, how many of those would be needed in the New England states in order to influence hunting recommendations or at least to make suggestions about hunting regulations? Yeah, I can't answer that question because hunting regulations are set up by each wildlife agency and it seems like each agency has a, a little different way or a little different, slightly different metric and, and what they goes into the setting hunting regulations and antlerless tag quotas. So it's probably gonna have to be done on a state by state basis and adapt, have it to the type of information that a specific state's looking for. In terms of total number of plots for the New England states, I wouldn't even want to venture a guess uh, online like this. It would really have to come down to, you know, land area expectations and probably some experimentation to look at at variance and different types of variance levels before you come up with a statistically valid sample size. Okay, Gene uh, has a question about. Uh, it relates really generally to the. Um, I'll say philosophy or the policy of New York for changes in deer populations, uh, either the questions about growing or increasing deer populations, but what uh, either increasing or decreasing, what what does what motivates the policy on setting of deer harvest levels? Do you know, Paul, or is that more of a DEC question? That's more of a DEC question, but there are a lot of things that go into that. Uh, forest condition, forest health is just one factor uh, that DEC uses. Uh, hunter satisfaction is another factor. Crop damage is another factor. Deer vehicle collisions or reported rates of deer vehicle collision could be another factor. So there's many different things that go in the, in the setting those objectives. What's the previous? buck take per square mile, what are previous population levels been over time? Uh, what's the habitat like? Uh, definitely uh, deer densities are much higher in the lower Hudson Valley versus habitat and winter conditions in the Adirondacks. So lo location is also important. So there's a number of factors that goes in the, that go into setting uh, deer harvest quotas and deer management objectives in different regions. And that's why New York State's broken down in these aggregated wildlife management units. These aggregated units are supposed to have similar deer against these similar ecological conditions to try to make management more consistency across those areas. Okay. 
Okay, several people thanking you. Just looking, scanning for questions. All right, so people say thanks for a good webinar, Paul, and I will second that. And I think we have gotten to the end of the questions. So I wanna, I appreciate uh, very good questions and thoughtful questions from everyone and uh, very thoughtful, of course, responses from Paul. So uh, thank you, everybody. We'll have a repeat of this webinar at seven o'clock. If uh, anyone wants to see it again, it's been recorded and it will soon be posted to the Forest Connect channel on YouTube. Thank you all very much. Wishing you a lovely afternoon. Paul, I'll see you back here a little before seven tonight. Thanks for a great presentation. Thanks, Peter. See you this evening.